We're ready to go. Yes. Why don't you lead us in prayer, yes. Jason? Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for the gathering of the saints. Father, we pray that we that you will prepare our hearts for this message. You'll give us the ears to hear and the eyes to see. Father, I pray that you will impart Christ into us so we'll be more prepared to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Father, I pray that we will all leave here very zealous for your 1611 King James Bible and that we will be increased in knowledge, but not a knowledge that puffs us up, but one that humbles us Amen. to your majesty and to your 1611 King James Bible. Father, we thank you for all that's gone into bringing this group together, mm -hmm. Paul Lucas's group and um, our group that's come together. Father, um, we pray that that's the seed of these groups coming together, mm -hmm. and we can't wait to see all the fruit that comes out of this. Yeah. Father, we thank you for all your protection. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your authority. Amen. And we thank you for this opportunity to serve your son, Jesus. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless our Father. First, I want to thank Paul for bringing his group and two great messages and his ministry. I want to thank Gary for all this work of putting all this t together and I know what it is <coughs> to, to put on a conference. Excuse me. Zephaniah 3 9 says, I will turn the people. A pure language. That they may all call, excuse me, upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. Amen. Gary did a good job about talking about the hands and the fingers. That's your top border. And then you have the feet, 26 bones. But most of you have probably, and I've been to a beer joint. You ever been to a beer joint? Anybody here? You have 33 joints in your feet. Each foot. That's 66. 33 is 1833. This is 1611. But when you're standing on your joints, better than a beer joint, you're standing on 66 joints, 66 books. Amen. Wow. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Amen. God is amazing. Amen. Now, I... Uh, I didn't really finish very well yesterday, so I'm going to try to mop the floor here a little bit <laughs> and, and finish. Uh, if you uh, happen to have Hosea in your Bible, turn to Hosea chapter 13. Hosea 13, 1. And you're going to see when you're married, you're all married, you're either married to your maker, who is your husband, yep. or you're married to Baal. There's no other options. Amen. They call Baal by a thousand different names. Amen. Amen. But it's all Baal. Amen. Right now the tournament is going, it's basketball. <laughs> and there's football. And there's golf ball. Amen. Amen. I used to love basketball. 
<laughs> you know, and I think back then, and, and actually I thought this this morning, I never really put this together. Here I'm 79, and I'm just figuring out what I did when I was a teenager. And I, I sat and wondered, has God been working on me all this time? I don't know why. Which, anyway, let, let's read this verse here. When Ephraim spake, trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended in Baal, he died. Baal is a death sentence. It'll put you on death row. Then let's go over to Hosea chapter 2, verse 16. He said... Pardon? 2.16, Hosea. And it shall be in that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi. If you look in the outer court, that is my husband. And shall no more call me Bailey, my Lord. See, the key definition of Baal, we have husband, we have Lord, but the key is to be married. You see, that's what, what happens. You're either married to Baal. America has married Baal. <coughs> Baal will give you prosperity. Baal is at the Wall Street market. Yay. So about 60 years ago, I was playing basketball on a high school team, and we had advanced to the championship game. We are to play at the University of North Dakota Fieldhouse. And I'm sitting there before the game, and I'm praying to God. I'd, I'd gotten saved. I didn't know what I was doing, but at a Billy Graham crusade. And I'm praying before the game, Lord, I'd love to be the leading scorer in this game. And I'm sure God told one of his angels, I think we can do that. <laughs> so after the game, a statistician named Lynn came up to me and said, guess what, Howard? You were the leading scorer. We won the game. Now, I, I, it's kind of interesting, and I, I hadn't thought about it till this morning. In this game, uh, and by the way, I was the most fouled player on our team the whole season. They just kept hitting me, and I kept going to the free throw line. Well, in the championship game, it was Nick and Tuck. We won, I think, by two or three points. But I shot 11 free throws. Mm. And I made 10 of them in the clutch of the game. Mm. And then I, a couple of field goals. And then I thought about that. The score that I had was 16 points mm. and 11 free throws, which is 16 11. <laughs> I never thought about that until this morning. And I was probably the last one to handle the ball in the game. And we had just a couple seconds on the clock, so I knew we'd won the game. Fought hard. We hadn't won a, a district championship in, uh, it seems like, hundreds of years. We're a little tiny town. And so I come driving to the basket, and, and I had an easy open layup. I never missed one in the whole season that I can remember. And I went up there, and the ball scooted off the thing. And I thought, why did that happen? How stupid could it be? And then I realized that if I had scored that basket, I would have a 6-6-6. <laughs> and God kept it at a 16-11. And let the guy on the other team, even though they lost, get the 6-6-6. <laughs> now, I, I'm just wondering, does God do things like this? I don't know. It's amazing. So, anyway, that kind of wraps up yesterday. And, 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 and 
uh, I want you to know that you're married to somebody and, and, and you've got to get a hold of this, this, these concepts of where you are and that look in your life. You'd be surprised how many things God is doing in your life that you're not even aware of. Now, most of you, uh, through the tours, are aware of this little book here, Basila Khan This means the kingly gift, also means the royal anointing. It was written by King James. And he wrote this for instructions to his dearest son, Henry, who was to be the king, but he died at 18. I believe it was... 1615. Amazing. This week, I got in the most amazing book. I'm 79, and this is the first time I even knew this book existed. This is The Works of the Most and Mighty Prince King James. Now, we got this from an original copy of... It's a Xerox copy, as you can see, taken from this original copy because a lot of the facsimiles, when you get them, they're not true facsimiles. Now, I've ordered a hardback facsimile through my friend Jack. He, he, he knows how to do all these things. And, and if I didn't have all these friends, such, such a blessing, I couldn't do it. Half of what I do. Excuse me. My friend David Van Ord chased this down and uh, he said, You got to get a copy. You got to see this thing. This is 621 pages written by King James. But I, I, I turn you to page 2. 87, and I'm not very good at notes. I'm not skilled like Paul and Gary, and they're, they're more orderly. I, I'm a man with many rabbit trails. <laughs> but, but listen to this introduction of this section of the book. To set it up, King James, he realizes the problem. The problem is Baal versus God. And in Baal, we're talking about the Pope and the Catholic structure. Now, I've stayed in a monastery. I've stayed with the monks. I've stayed with the Catholic priest. There are a lot of wonderful people in the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, most of them are deceived. There's a few uh, friends that know their way around and I believe are missionaries in, in, in the deal. So don't write them off. I've been to the Vatican. I've looked up in the Sistine Chapel, seen the Pope painted in hell by Michelangelo. I've seen the statues. I've touched them that you can't touch anymore. I even was in the Louvre one time or somewhere by the Louvre and there's the Mona Lisa and of course don't touch but I'm a little nasty boy. I couldn't resist when the guards were looking the other way. I touched the old Mona. Amen. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't do that stuff anymore. I, I remember being in Florence, Italy and rubbing King David's big toe, <laughs> which a lot of other people rub too. Listen to this. A premonition to the most mighty monarchs, kings, and free princesses, and the states of Christendom. This is King James writing. To the most sacred and invincible prince, Rudolf II, the king of Germany, king of Hungary, king of Bohemia, Dalmatia, Croatia, Slovakia, Archduke of Austria, and so other, and to all others, right and mighty kings. 
what he's telling them. This is by James, by the grace of God, of the great Britain, France, Ireland, professor, maintainer, defender of the true Christian apostolic faith. And he uses the Catholic because there, there's the Catholic and then there's the Catholic. Totally two different things. One is Romanish, Popish, the other is, in fact, you'll find the word Catholic in John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, telling you you need to compare everything by the Catholic faith. That's totally different than the Catholic faith, which is explained in the preparatory. Okay. He goes into this here, and I'll just read you a couple of things here. The popes are against the warrant of all scriptures. Now, he uses this word warrant. A warrant is a legal term to be arrested with a warrant. This 1611 Bible is God's sworn out warrant against us, to witness against us. You, you, you see that? And he's looking at it as a warrant that the popes are against all the scriptures. And then in parentheses, ancient consuls of the fathers upon the temporal power of kings. That's on page 292. On page 295, it talks about the popes wants the power to, over kings to throne and to dethrone them at his pleasure. Most people don't realize that the Pope declares himself to be the vicar of Christ. They know that and over the religious world, but most people don't realize that the Pope is over the whole world, the governmental world. That's why you see whenever you get a new president, they quickly go to the Vatican to kiss the Pope's ring. Now, I've seen some of the dead popes with the cobwebs in their face. They have them on display there at the Vatican. Uh, that was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I couldn't figure out why they didn't vacuum the cobwebs off their face, but they left them there. Uh, maybe it's indicative, I don't know. But I didn't get to meet the uh, real pope, but one of my closest friends took one of these big black Bibles and shipped it as a present to the Pope. <laughs> Hope, hoping he'll get a deal. Amen. So, to be the power over the kings to throne and dethrone them at will, and yet onely subject Christian kings to that slavery of the Romanist religion. Page 295. 337, his lieutenants upon the earth, I think this is talking about God's lieutenants upon the earth, For the, and I got three dots here, so there's stuff in between, the spiritual liberty of the ghost spell with our temporal freedom and temporal kingdoms of the world. King James recognizes the ghost spell. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I'm not going to read the whole book. There's a whole lot, but uh, this is just an amazing piece of literature that eventually, hopefully, we'll have a copy here in the museum and that some of you will be able to work your way through this. this I didn't know this existed. I, I don't know anybody here that knew this existed. I didn't know. King James, by the time he was 15, had about eight different languages under his belt. He understood languages. He, somewhere in this treatise, my friend tells me there is a treatise on the whole book of Revelation. Now, I've just been hunting around here and having fun, but uh, th this will keep me occupied for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
it, it's just a, a, a beautiful uh, work, the work in, yeah, you, uh, you can take that, of, of King James. Now, language is a really interesting thing. And I hope to give you a whole new idea of, of, of what language is. Now, I pull this out of the Gutenberg Bible this morning. And uh, I don't know where I've, I've got my notes here. Well, we'll, we'll just... Uh, Okay, we'll just wing this here. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand is how precise books are. The Gutenberg Bibles, if those of you taking the tour, you're aware of those facsimiles. What we have here is different letters. There are Eight, I think it's eight different A's. There may be as many as nine different B's. There is, I think, seven different C's. Equally, seven or eight different I's. If you catch what's going on here, each <laughs> one of these letters, even though it appears to be the same letter, has a distinct and different meaning. So when you get to the 1611 Bible, God comes along and he makes the equation a lot easier. But English is a very phenomenal language. Edmund Coote is probably one of the greatest masters of English in the history of the world. He wrote his book in 1596, it laid the groundwork for what they were going to do in God's favorite book. This is really important when you, when you see old Edmund Coote. Now, if you try to go online, you'll find Edmund Coote. You will find what they call facsimiles. But we have discovered that the original, and we have copies of the original, original. And on page 33, he shows why Jesus is always spelled with an I. These are important things. You get a sanitized copy. They won't let you get an original copy anymore that I know of anywhere online. Satan is trying to shut the back doors. But you got to understand things like an integral S. Say, what is an integral S? Well, there's a kind of a rule that goes with integral S. You, it alters the following letter. You take the word saved. It's spelled S-A-U-E-D. You've got to have U to get saved. The integral S affects the A. That drops out of the picture. And now you have the word sued. This is all part of language and understanding how it works because this is a legal document yeah. and it tells you that they put the book in the side of the ark. You ask people what was in the ark. Oh, well, we had the manna, we have Aaron's rod, we have the Ten Commandments and they stopped there. Ah, it says in Jer uh, Deuteronomy 31, I believe it is, it tells you that the book of the law was in the side of the ark and it was put there to be a witness against you. Yeah. So you could be sued in the court of law. It's appointed on a man once to die and after that, the judgment. Wow. You are there in judgment. And if you don't understand the blood because you see, you're going to lose this case. Yeah. And you've got to be in a repentant state. And then you have forgiveness. Wow, what a wonderful lawyer and judge and master. 
But you got to understand that you're being sued. Everybody is being sued. He came to sue us. You see, you got to understand English. Then you have rotunda, R. Rotunda means round. It's going to affect the letter before. It's going to affect the letter after. Then you have the factotums on every chapter. You have that big thing in a square box. But also every letter, every first letter is a factotum. Take the word bread. You drop the B off, and what do you have? Read, read. This whole book is full of this. And when you start seeing these then you have grandfathering. Most people have no idea about grandfathering or engrossing. The old grocer would go to the farmer, buy some potatoes, take them home and wash them, put a ribbon around them, charge three times as much. He engrossed them. They paid $30 to the guy who received the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence to engross it, to make it beautiful. Grandfathering is part of engrossing. You take the, what grandfather means when you take a letter up here and you bring it down, part of that letter, and you touch the letter in the next line below. It's a connection. It's a kind of a marriage. And it, it, it changes the meaning of what you're looking at. Yeah. So you got to learn how to deal with these different things. Now part of part, part, part of this whole journey is your personal experiences. Now, I grew up on a farm in northern Minnesota. So I got to throw in a few of those Minnesota stories. And uh, I was about eight years old. And my daddy gets his brilliant idea that he's going to make a farmer on me. You know, a farmer is one who's outstanding in his field. I don't know if you caught that or not. So uh, he uh, takes me out to this field and he says, I want to teach you how to cultivate. So um, he makes a round around the whole perimeter. We call it the border. He says, now, son, I want you to stay within where we cultivate it. Now, my dad was a little over ambitious. He was long on uh, commandments, but short on instruction. <laughs> and uh, so he gets me out there, and we have this big red tractor called an international harvester. Some of you know what that is. It had those big, tall wheels, five and a half, six foot tall. No fenders, at least on ours, had no fenders. You have this seat that acts like a trampoline because the, the, uh, the fields are really bumpy and it had a big spring. But you imagine, here's a little eight, nine-year-old kid sitting on this seat who couldn't reach the pedals. Fortunately, you had the accelerator on, on the uh, steering arm there. And you pull down, it go faster, you push up, and it goes slower. So he taught me what gear to go in. I believe it was third gear. And uh, he left me. He says, finish the field. <laughs> so I'm getting out there, and I've made it kind of crooked. You know, you're an eight-year-old. You're daydreaming and get it home. And then I finished it, and I thought I was pretty proud of myself. So I, uh, I made this. Uh, I should have just turned the key off and uh, stopped it and walked home, which would be better uh, than a quarter, maybe a little close to a half mile or not quite that. But I got the crazy bright idea. I did so good on the field, I think I can drive this rig home. <laughs> now, uh, this big wide cultivator, wider than the road, <laughs> and, and uh, the wheels fit on the road, but that was about it. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and of course, uh, I wasn't speaking India at that time. We'll cover that story a little later. But I uh, I found a high gear. 
they call them road gears, but uh, I don't know if I got the wide open gear or not, but I was going pretty fast, and, and uh, faster than I should have. So I come around the corner, and then I decide, wait a minute, I got to figure out where to park this big rig because there's trucks going to be coming and going maybe, and tractors, and, and uh, uh, I better find a cool place to park this thing. So I come around the corner, and I realize there's not really a good place. So I think, I better slow this thing down. And instead of slowing it down, I speeded it up oh. full wide. Oh. And, and now I'm getting scared because I know I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna run into something. And I look up, and there's a 500 gallon fuel tank full of fuel. Oh. And, and, uh, and I'm coming straight at it. Fortunately, uh, the angels were there because I hit it square. And, and now all I could do was hold on. And I, I hit this thing, and suddenly we start going, you know, over, over the hills and through the woods to Grandma's house we go. Uh, the, the trees are giving way, and they're bending down and bowing down to me. <laughs> And every time I, and fortunately this had, it was up on a 10 foot stand. And fortunately that stand was built very well because we're pushing these trees down like toothpicks and then they would flop up as we go past. And, and we kept going through the woods until finally old Joe, I think, I think old Joe was a big oak tree. He said, I think Sonny, you've had enough. And he jumped out right in front. Unfortunately, it was square. And that gas tank was longer than the stand. So when the gas tank hit the tree, it started coming back on the tractor. And I thought, this, this could be serious, because if that thing goes open or the gas spills, we're going to have an explosion. I'm going to get blown to kingdom come. But fortunately, that we hit the tree. And the back end of the tractor must have lifted off two or three inches from the ground, maybe five, I don't know. But the cultivator, who was like a snake now in the back of the tractor, it jumped a couple of feet up in the air. I, I still remember it coming up. And boom, and it lay down. Well, thank the Lord I was in a high gear because there's not as much torque. If I was in a low gear, I would have bent the frame and then everything would have come down. So, of course, when you're an eight, nine-year-old boy, what you got to do now is run and hide. <laughs> you can't stick around. So, uh, and, and the best place to hide is in your bedroom because nobody will find you there. So, I, uh, I excuse me, I, I go to the bedroom and I hide there for about an hour and then... Uh, the Jolly Green Giant, my dad, wonderful man, comes in there and he said, son, how did you do with the cultivating? I said, well, I got it all done. It looks beautiful. Good. He says, well, what I've been doing, I've been looking for the tractor. Where did you park the tractor? I didn't see it on the field and I can't see it in the yard. Oh, I parked it over there by the tree, by the gas tank. So my dad goes out looking for the tractor, and then he realized how serious his son could have been killed that day, that he needed to give a little more instruction. The fear of God came all over him. And the fear of God came all over me mm -hmm. to learn to listen mm -hmm. to your parents. Yeah, amen. Wow. It talks about in Psalm 111 that the fear of God breeds breeds let me read that understanding let me see if I can find that. This is one of the most powerful psalms. The fear of God breeds 
true wisdom. Did you see that? The fear of God. Everywhere you see the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That is a pregnant term. That is a marriage term as your marriage to the father who is your husband. And you're in the breeding process. We are here to breed the American nation into the 1611 Bible. That's our assignment. Amen. We're married to the Father. We were married to Him. Your maker is your husband. Wow. Wow. Now, I don't know if you've ever had this situation. I'm a little boy, and my daddy, wonderful man, so is my mother. But my daddy one day comes dragging home a church, a literal church building. Have any of you had that experience? <laughs> Where he comes driving home? A big old church building. What are we going to do with a church building on a farm property? <laughs> well, we, we, we were like a coal miner's daughter. Remember that song? That they didn't have much money. And we didn't have much money. My dad was starting out, and we needed a shop. You've got to have a place where you're going to fix your tractors, change the oil, and all that stuff. And I don't know how he got it. Never really asked him. I wish I had. How in the world did you get this church? Talk these people out of their church. <laughs> Brings it home, cuts a big hole in there, puts a big door on there. And now we got a shop. Wasn't much of a shop. Oh, well, it was a beautiful building. Uh, later, after my dad passed away, I was able to store uh, my 35 Ford sedan in there. So I it got good uses. But, but I, I, I started looking. Here I'm a little boy and I'm looking at this church building. Why would somebody give up their church building? So some of, they didn't care what we were going to use it for or make it for. But why would you give up a church building? A beautiful, it was a beautiful building, steeple and all. Why would you do that? I used to lay over at my neighbor's property, Levi Anderson, and we later ended up having their property. Levi, the Levites, it's like God put this in there. I'd look up the, the sky, and uh, when I was taking an extra long lunch break, I probably shouldn't have, but you know how little boys are, eating my sandwiches and wondering about all this, and then wondering about why are all these churches quitting business? Why are 10,000 churches in America today on an average going out of business? What would possess them to build a beautiful building and 50 years later they're abandoning it? Somehow they gave up. And it can all be tied to these modern versions. The more modern you get, the less you read them. Yep. Barner's research show that a people that have a King James Bible, any King James Bible, they read them five times more than someone who's got an NIV or an Amen. ESV or whatever. Amen. These Bibles, they say they're easier, but they make it worse. Yeah. Yes, amen. We're losing ground. Amen. Look, look at the nation since we've got these Bibles. Look at the nation since we had Noah Webster out there with his phony Bible. Yeah. Amen. It's getting worse and worse yeah. and worse. Amen. Went through a civil war, but it's war after war after war. We're a whoremongering nation. Yes, we yeah. are. Amen, yes. Wow. So we need the, the fear of Lord. Yeah. One of the things I don't know if I covered yesterday, we talked about the headliners. The one who holds the most headlines in the New Testament is Christ. Amen. 48 times. Jesus is there one time. 48 and 1 is 49. That's seven 
times seven. Someone brought that up this morning. Apostle Paul gets about 24 times. God gets about 10 times. These are important. Now, when we want to study and understand language, we've got to understand how words work. One of the most confusing words in the English language is before. People will read Ephesians 3.21, or excuse me, Ephesians 1.4. You already probably know what that says. Ephesians 1 4 says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, we should be holy without blame and in love. I think, oh, there's my packet here. Let me see if I can. I don't travel very light. I, I got all kinds of little projects here. Oh, I didn't mention this. This is my book on Cut Your Tie with Bail. Most people don't realize when you're wearing a necktie, you're saying I'm part of Bail's marriage. I'm married to Baal. Yeah. I spent a lot of time, and you have to spend a lot of effort if you want to figure out what this is. And here we have uh, Mary with Jesus, hardly any clothes on, and what has he got around his neck? A necktie. Mm. You have the unka, uh, the necktie, the bow tie, bow to the tie. This is a symbol. The Mennonites call it the devil's lead rope. I once saw a Mennonite in the Dallas airport, and I, I said, uh, do you know why you don't wear neckties? He said, I sure do. And we became uh, friends, I think, until he passed away or so. I stayed at his house. He stayed at my house. But uh, on this subject here, according to his chosen us and him before the foundation of the world. Now, this word before can be confusing. I wrote a whole book on this, so, and I'm not going to talk about that all, all here, but I want you to see uh, a lot of people think this means before the world was began, you were chosen. It's not saying that at all. In order to have a time concept in there, you would have to have the word chronos in there. And... Uh, when we're talking about languages, one of the languages that we have is, is Greek. And so uh, I had studied Greek a little bit. I studied a year at the University of Minnesota. I studied two years in Seattle Pacific. It's now called Seattle Pacific University. And I studied at Asbury Theological Seminary. They all uh, was great experiences. But I was really dissatisfied with the Greek because after four years of classroom Greek, it was still Greek to me. Yep. Yep. And so I, I said, you know, I think we can do a better job. So I'm going to write my own textbook. So I wrote this textbook here. It's got my name on it. I guess there you can barely see it. A Guide to New Testament Greek. I got special permission from a college to teach their students there. We had a student, uh, we're going to do a uh, experimental testing uh, of a whole new way of teaching Greek. And uh, if any of you want to learn Greek, I can practice on you. <laughs> and uh, I think in three months I can have you reading Greek instead of four years wow. and not being able to read it. And my, my theory here, see, Greek is an interesting language. Hebrew is a great language. Hebrew is all consonants. Greek is consonants and vowels. 
But then we get to the granddaddy of all languages, the Angelish language, English. It is vowels, it is consonant, vowels, and liquid letters. And most of you probably never heard of liquid letters. You've got to study dictionaries at least 150 years old and older. Well, we are all set up to do a trial on this to teach this. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you the quick theory here because this is part of learning languages. Is uh, <clears throat> my wife uh, decided to get pregnant. I guess she didn't decide on herself, but she, she got pregnant. And uh, at the time, I was uh, uh, I spoke the language of vacuum cleaners because that's how I was supporting myself. And. Uh, I, I realize I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to have to do some work. And so I, I set this aside. I think that was God getting me to set it aside. And we never did the, the experiment with the students, the student at the college there. Uh, because had I got there, I was planning to get a doctorate in Greek. And I was planning to go to Harvard and Sorbonne University. I had all these dreams. And uh, God shut it all down. And had he not shut it down, we, I, I never would have got this open because I would have been stuck in some college or some university uh, teaching Greek. Uh, before I finished college, uh, they offered me a job to be a college professor, which I don't know if it happens that often. And God just opened doors for me. When I was at college, I had my own office in the faculty office building. I don't know, that was a miracle. I had two paid secretaries, and I had a paid helper, and I ran the gospel team program out of there. And uh, we somehow were the first time they ever made money. I mean, we, had, we did over 400 meetings in one year. So I was kind of an ambitious character. So I tackled this here, and I said, I think I can make teaching Greek a lot easier. What I did is I boiled down the language of Greek has uh, 5,600 words in your New Testament. There are... 300 root words. My theory is if you memorize the 300 root words, you now have the working vocabulary because everything else is a combination of this 300 root words. The grammar is the toughest thing to learn in a language. And so by reading or, or knowing or memorizing 300 root words, now you can, just like a little baby, you start navigating uh, mama, daddy, and you, you get the basic root words down, and then you work on it. Hebrew works the same way. There are about 8,000 uh, words in your Hebrew Old Testament. There are about six to 700 root words. That gives you a 1,000-word vocabulary, and you can navigate in Hebrew and, and Greek through the whole Bible. That's, that's amazing. But... English is an amazing master language. It has about 10,000 basic root words. You have 10 times the vocabulary in English that you do in Greek and Hebrew combined. Yeah. That's absolutely amazing when you start understanding this. So I haven't really used this textbook. It's in a rough draft format, but I believe it will still work. But I'm kind of glad that God derailed me and got me going in a different direction. So now we're back to the word before and before the foundation of the world. So you have to ask yourself, which world are we talking about? We go to uh, Ephesians 3.21. Since we're right here, we'll look at this. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. We read in Hebrews that he founded the worlds. 
Okay, so which world he found it? We go to Isaiah 45, 1. Uh, it's not 45, 1, it's 45, 17, I think it is. But Israel, which shall be saved in the Lord, it's the only place you can get saved, Amen. with an everlasting salvation, you shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. So when Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, which world was he slain before? I believe he was slain before the foundation of Israel. The church came in because Israel turned her back, his back against God. So now you understand a little bit about this word before. Go to 2 Samuel 6.21. This will help you see it a little bit more. And, and remember in Acts 12.14, Peter stood before the gate. Did he stand before the gate was built or did he stand in front of the gate? Now look at 2 Samuel 6, 21. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord now, certainly, David was not before the Lord existed. Right. So, obviously, before here is in, can be interpreted that he was in front of or in plain view mm -hmm. of the Lord, Amen. which chose me before thy father. Now we have a different understanding of before. Amen. See, you can get the same word can be used a number of different ways. This is how language works with English. It's a very profound, a very complex language. But you've got to understand some of the basic rules if you're going to be, because this book that God deal is a special language all to itself. Before thy father, ampersand, before all his house. Now we're in preference. It's like a, I'm going to choose this basketball player over this one, before this one, to go out and play. For thy father and all his house to appoint me ruler over all the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play before the Lord. See how he's using this? in a couple different ways here. You, you, you got to watch how this thing works. Now, go to Leviticus 25, 31. Now this uh, 25, did I say 31? But the houses of the villages which have no walls round about them shall be accounted as the fields of the country that they may e redeem. Now, your scholar is going to say, what, well, that should be B, and we've got a mistake there. Mm, that's good. Okay, you all follow that? You've got to have a 1611 and 1833 to see this. The double E. To start you out in elementary understanding of the language of the King James Bible, 
You've got to understand the E, the fifth letter in the Greek alphabet. It's called epsilon. Epsilon. Now, I typed in the word epsilon in my Google search or in... Uh, what, what's that thing I look at? Uh, that, uh, anyway, uh, what's the, close, close enough. What? That's no, close we enough. We know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm having a senior moment here. I can't remember what. Uh, I, I got to get. get <laughs> okay. So I typed it in and uh, I sit and listen to this on YouTube. That's what I'm looking for. I know it come to me. And the first thing I got is, uh, it, it took me back to uh, my marriage thing because it was, uh, uh, who, who's that blind black singer? Ray Charles. Ray Charles and I can't stop loving you. That's what came up when I typed in Epsilon. But the E by itself means that which is lacking. The E is not complete until it has its marriage partner. This is the first letter that I, I wrote a book, Learning Your ABCs, and, and I, I realized this E is a phenomenal thing. The word believe. Most people, and the world spells it all the way back that I trace it to 1530. B-E-L-I-E-V-E -E -E has a lie in it. Now, I know there are other words that have a lie in it, and I've been studying those. And there's a purpose in that. Holiest is one of them. But believe is spelled, I could not find it in any Reformation Bible, even the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible. I can't find it spelled with a lie in it. One of God's favorite words. B-E-L-E-E-U-E. -E -E. The U, you got to have U to believe. And the double E means like a complete marriage from eternity to eternity. See how powerful this is. Now, to understand how the E works, turn to 1 John. I'll just give you a little tutorial here. This is really... important. That which was from ye beginning, which we, double E, have heard, which we, double E, have seen with our eyes, which we, double E, have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. The double E means the spiritual. It's obvious they weren't physically handling Jesus. See, see the pattern there? Verse 3, that which we, double E, have seen and heard, declare we. The double E switches to the single E because when you're going to declare something, it's physical. That ye, single E, also... Oh, I got to stop right there. Uh, Gary, Gary did a good job on uh, three fifteen of Ruth, but you remember the first word in Ruth three fifteen. Anybody know what that is? Also, you anagram the word, and it turns into lasso. You lasso the world with the three fifteen. And by the way, do you know how many times also occurs 
in the King James Bible? 1,769 times. It's presenting the 1,769 as one of the way God lost lassoes people into his kingdom to birth a man. And then he takes them to the he and the she Bible. It's all in that little scripture. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So I'll get off that rabbit trail. But thank you, Gary, for bringing that up. That we, and then it goes to single E, and notice that ye also may have fellowship. Nine letters. Nine means what? Salvation. Letters with you. And truly our fellowship, now fellowship jumps to two L's, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You've now gone into a deeper relationship. You can see how this Bible pulls you in. Uh, uh, scripture 4, write we, single E, you're writing sale. We have heard 5. Six, if we say we, we're, we're, we're in the more carnal state, I don't want to call it carnal, but in the earthly state, we say that we have fellowship or salvation with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we, double E, walk in the light as he is in the light, we double E, have fellowship, double L, with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we, in a pagan state, so to speak, say we, single E, have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he, double E, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, single E, single E, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You learn how to read this language. It'll bless your socks off. I don't know if that's a good term, but it, it, it'll bless you. Say, I'm, I'm helping you climb a mountain today. And uh, we have 1769 at the base. I don't know if any of you have climbed mountains, but mountains are, to me, a beautiful experience. And uh, I love when you get to the peak because you see everything from a different perspective. You ever notice that? You can look down if you're tall enough mountain and you can see the clouds are down here and you're up here. Yeah, I, I, I once took a college girl up that mountain. Now, I won't say anymore. <laughs> but but it, it, it's an experience. Down here, I, I call this 1769. It's the same mountain, but you're at the base. And it's a wonderful place to camp. I've been at the base of Mount Rainier. Later, blew up a glass. It wasn't there when it blew up. But it was a beautiful mountain. And then you get up a ways to the 1833, you see everything from a different perspective. But when you get up here, the view is spectacular. Wow. Yay. So this is, uh, you got to go to the mountain. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you this little word, the. This is part of the language of the scripture. This is the most used word in the King James Bible. The T is the Tau, which is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and the Tau represents the cross. And if you go to the cross, Jesus said, except, you know, he tells us that in his message, unless you hate your father, your mother, your daughter, your wife, your children, you cannot be my disciple. Amen. That's pretty strong language. Mm -hmm. Unless you take up the cross daily, you can't be my disciple. Now, he never tells the wife you can give up your husband, but he tells the 
husband, you have to, in other words, he says, I want you to be married to me and to me, number one, in everything. That's a tough assignment, but that's what he's demanding. You can't be my disciple. He says it over and over again. And if you go to the cross, what you're doing is you're getting married to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And you're coming into a marriage, an intimate relationship with the Father. That's why there, if you once get resurrected, there's no marriage in, in, in heaven given in marriage. So you, you understand that. And uh, wow, so the cross and the result of going to the cross is you go into holiness. Remember, we have consonants, we have vowels, and we have liquid letters. Follows the three patterns of the tabernacle. Got to see how that works. And this is holiness. This is the fruit of righteousness. He can't give you, he never gave Abraham holiness. He gave him righteousness. He believed and it was counted as righteousness. Once you get righteousness, you take that out in your garden and you plant it in your life. And the fruit of that is holiness. You can see all this in the end of Romans chapter 6. It's all laid out there. Once you got holiness there, the benefit of holiness is eternity, eternal life. The whole gospel can be summed up in this little word, the. So pay attention. Every jot, every tittle is so extremely important to see. I don't know how much more time I've got here. Do I? I'm a half an hour past? I'm on page two or three. What's the main, what's the main takeaway you want everyone to have? Well, I, I think you, you've got it. I, I was going to talk about... Uh, You're a half an hour over. Uh, okay, if you want, I'll stop. I, I, I'll, I'll, the reason why they call it God dwells in the thick darkness, that means it's called gothic, go thick. You see that? Now, I'll just give you one quick takeaway here John 18 6 I'll just read it back uh, and I'll, I'll wind this up here the uh, w when Judas and them came to Christ when Jesus said I am he I am the great he Bible they fell backwards backwards is spelled B A C K E W A R D. This is a time factor. They went backwards. You go back into 2 Kings 2011, you'll have to look, and the sun went backwards for Hezekiah. Isaiah 38 8, the sun went backwards. No E in between the K and the W. But Ecclesiasticus, and I'll, I'll go direct this one, uh, 48.24. And then I'll wrap it up here. Uh, th this again, the uh, Apocrypha gives us a, a great insight here. Let's see. 48. Okay, 48.23. In his time, the sun went backward and he lengthened the king's light. Now, NASA wouldn't agree with this. Uh, that the sun is what's going around the earth. And the sun literally back, went backwards. And if you follow all of this together, 
Judas and all those guys went backwards. And if you listen to uh, the modern day politicians, they're all trying to say we need to go forward. What God is saying is you need to go backwards. You need to go backwards to the Father. You need to get married to him. Stay away from this guy, Baal. And so what he was doing, I believe, when those fellows all went backwards, when they saw the He Bible, God was giving them a chance to <coughs> repent. God is giving the world a chance to go backward and repent. He'll even turn the sun backwards. I had a beautiful set of Calvin's commentaries. When he got to this passage, he said, the sun really didn't go backwards. A cloud came between the sundial and the earth there somehow, and it made it to appear to go backwards. I said, wow, if Everything is just an appearance. Maybe the crucifixion, the resurrection is an appearance. So I took Calvin's commentaries. Probably shouldn't have done this. I was young and, and rash. I took them out to my big burner. I had a big burner that I'd bring semi loads of wood in. I had this house that was 9,000 square feet or 138 windows. And I burned all of his commentaries. We, 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 we got to learn how to go backwards. And what we're doing with this museum is trying to get the church to go backwards to the 1611 Bible. I'll close right there. I'm on probably page four and I got about 10, 15 more to go.